will introduce you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Cassandra, and this is Alex and Bailey, and we're all first year campus students. So today we have the absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Gary Marks and Dr. Elizabeth Kuga, both of whom I'm sure we have all referenced in a paper <laughs> this semester. Um, Dr. Gary Marks is a Burton Craig Professor of Political Science at UNC Chapel Hill and a research professor at the Robert Schuman Center for Advanced Studies at the European University Institute in Florence, Italy. Dr. Marks actually co-founded the U UNC Center for European Studies and the EU Center for Excellence in 1994 and 1998, His previous research includes analyzing unions in the left, measuring regional authority and theories of international uh, organization, even developing the concepts of multi-level governance and post-functionalism alongside Dr. Hooker. Dr. Marx's most recent research, just as Dr. Hooker's, analyzes the social roots of political parties, partisanship, and privileges. From 2021 to 2025, Dr. Marx and Professor Kuka are conducting research on political polarization in Western European societies and at both the EUI and UNC. Every other year, they go back and forth between EUI and UNC, so we are all very, very lucky to have them here this year. Yes, so I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Elizabeth Huga. Um, so for her education, she went to uh, KU Leuven. Um, for her bachelor's and her PhD, um, and she's held numerous fellowships in political science and has received a lot of award awards as well. Um, and of course, as we all know, she's contributed significantly to the political science discourse. Um, and then a little interesting fact about it, um, I noticed that 40,777 other publications have cited her work. Um, so just to give the numbers, um, you didn't read them all, did you? <laughs> no, no. Um, but um, as Cass said, they do alternate between this university at Chapel Hill and the university in Florence. Um, so yeah. Yeah, some fun facts. Um, both Dr. Marx and Dr. Huga enjoy watching the Borkin series. Dr. Marx is a very avid online chess player, but no distractions at all. Um, uh, Dr. Huga enjoys play chess, <laughs> um, Both are interested in further research in North Carolina and even served as poll watchers during this most recent election. Um, like we've talked about, they conduct research in Florence often and love living there and eating food, especially. Um, when I asked them what advice they would offer the current uh, master's students, Dr. Mark said to <coughs> invest in doing what you love and if that is your comparative advantage, Really focus on that topic because a career that you're truly interested in will fulfill you and allow you to be productive and contribute um, what you're best at. And Dr. Huga had similar advice and she said that to find out what makes you tick and then find out what experiences will help you excel in this area. So thank you very much for being here. We're very excited to hear what you guys have to talk about today. <laughs> Cassandra, Bailey, and Alex, thank you for just a wonderful introduction. And, and it's it's great to meet the entire class. Um, each of you us have met some of you in the time classes. Also, welcome to my 4448. Um, um, this is really what we're going to be doing today is, is work in progress. And, and that means that more than perhaps usual, um, your feedback is, is very much welcome. Um, so, because this is not going to be the same presentation if we're doing it a few months from now. Probably something will have changed. Yeah, welcome from me to this is a delight to see um, you know, such uh, interest and Tam being so productive and such a great uh, kind of cohort um, this year to the uh, Transatlantic Masters Program and uh, these 400 classes that are here too. So a uh, welcome. And um, this is you know, this is one of those examples where we're doing ongoing research um, that is, you know, that we present it to a, uh, an audience like you. We really have to think about, you know, what are the what are the pieces? And so research and teaching are so kind of connected um, uh, for us. And we've given this talk in very, you know, academic audiences of professors and, 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 and so forth. And it's a real kind of pleasure to to present it to, uh, to you today. Um, Okay, well, let me, I'm going to begin um, by talking about a political cleavage. It's, it's a talk about, is there a political cleavage 
uh, today in Western um, in, in in Western Europe, and and there are a lot of conflicts in the society, a lot of conflicts. But there are some conflicts that are major that really persist, that are durable, that are uh, that are rooted, that are structural, that are not ad hoc, they're not just kind of fly by night kind of conflicts, but they have some kind of durability. And a definition would be a durable, socially rooted divide that structures, that structures conflict in a society. And there's a lot of literature on this. And if you look at that literature, you see that there are four kind of basic features of a cleavage that can be generalized across societies and, and, and over time. So the question we're gonna actually ask is, is what's happening today a, um, a cleavage? Let me talk about the very briefly what these uh, basic features are. The first is that a cleavage arises in a an, an exogenous um, shock, that is a major shock that really upsets or fractures uh, the status quo, that um, really affects, that changes the life chances of major groups of individuals in a um, in a society. And so we're talking about something that's like, you know, what would those exogenous shocks be? Well, um, the creation and deepening centralization of national states. Um, that's something you can, one might take for granted, but it's a major exogenous shock in the context of European um, uh, history. Uh, the Reformation, the um, Industrial Revolution, something of that um, magnitude. And what then you know, might happen is that um, those individuals who are affected, who are negatively affected, the losers, or people who feel that they're losing in some fundamental way, may develop a kind of an opposition, grievances. And when you think about what um, motivates um, individuals to form groups that are really form a political opposition, you're talking not about the possibility of some gain, but the sense of grievance among a group of, of individuals. Thirdly, and absolutely kind of crucially, that these grievances are socially rooted. What does that mean? Um, that means that the effect of this exogenous shock is highly consequential, highly consequential for some group of individuals, uh, and yet um, it's, it's um, constrainedly volitional. That is to say, people can't escape the consequences. So take the Industrial Revolution. Um, a worker born into a lower class or worker's family. Now, you know, you might turn around and say, well, why don't you become an employer, own a factory? But those people are pretty much stuck. They're pretty much stuck in a particular situation. A few might escape. But the social rootedness indicates that, well, you know, there's something that is very difficult for individuals to change. They're stuck in that particular social in society. Um, and, um, and that might even be intergenerational. So you, even if you are thinking about, so for example, you take the religious cleavage, you know, those who are born as Catholics or Protestants tend to uh, be that way for the remainder of their lives. And they're generally born into families that have the same um, characteristics. Um, and then finally, party system change, that when you get these deeply held um, oppositions, they can express themselves in, in the creation and character of political of political parties. So what we're kind of putting on the table here is something that kind of begins with a fundamental change in the society and ends in the character of the party system. So it's a pretty kind of wide ranging and kind of intellectually ambitious frame. And let me give you a, a, um, a kind of a, a feeling for what that means in the context of, of, um, of Europe. And this is drawn actually from a work by Simon Martin Lipsitz and Stein Rokan. Uh, it's an article published in the mid 1960s, 1967. Uh, these were the, the, you might say, the, the greatest or among the greatest political scientists, political sociologists of their generation. And they came up with this really quite, you know, on, I can put it actually on one slide, uh, the pattern of cleavage in, uh, in Europe. And what you have is the source. So 
two basic sources, national revolution, the creation and centralization of national states, and then the industrial revolution. And the national, and you've got four cleavages that arise out of these exogenous shocks. The first, the center periphery. So you've got national states developing in the 16th century. I and mean, we're talking about deep kind of history here. National states developing in the um, in the in the 16th century, and encompassing communities that resisted them, and in many cases resisted them fiercely, because either they wanted their own states or they wanted autonomy. Um, Wales and Scotland in 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 Britain, um, the uh, Catalonia and the Basque Country in um, in Spain, and coming out of that, regional separatist parties like um, the CIU or the Scottish Nationalist Party and so by Kim Roo in, in, in Wales. It's an interesting example, actually, because a cleavage can kind of go to sleep. If you were in 1950, you'd say, well, you know, that cleavage is really, that center periphery cleavage doesn't really do much anymore. And then what if it didn't come back into life in the 1970s? So a cleavage can go to sleep and uh, reawaken. Uh, the second cleavage that arose out of the National Revolution has to do with the autonomy of the church and its control over education. And there we see, and there Lipset and Rokan saw, writing in the 1960s, the, the existence of these major Christian democratic parties. And then the Industrial Revolution. And first of all, the rise of an industrial bourgeoisie that hated the idea of agricultural tariffs. And um, wanted to preserve their control of the political system, didn't want to give the rising middle classes the vote, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, that industrial bourgeoisie uh, expressed in liberal parties, the land, landed elites were expressed in conservative parties, and though that industrial bourgeoisie wanted um, lower tariffs for agricultural products. They wanted a kind of a place in the political song. They wanted certain basic um, freedoms and the creation of liberal, um, of liberal parties. Basically, an urban rural, the industrial bourgeoisie being urban, and the agricultural elites, these landed magnates, um, based in the uh, in, in rural areas. And then finally, the most famous of them, the most general one, the industrial revolution giving rise to working the working class, the industrial working class, their sense of intense exploitation and grievance, leading to. I'm really you know, cutting things directly here in the interest of time, leading to the development of socialist and social democratic parties. So it's a, it's a big reach. We're talking about developments that took place from the 16th century. Lipset and Rokan writing in the 1960s and saying, look, the parties that we're, we're seeing around us today, the regionalist parties, the Christian democratic parties, conservative liberal parties, socialist parties, the major party families have their roots in these basic exogenous, you can call them exogenous shocks. They're exogenous because they take place outside of the party system. They're not generated by parties themselves. Political parties are responses to these particular um, particular shocks. So it's very wide ranging. But you know, the question we're posing is, what now? You know, is it is 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 there something? Is it a a story about the past? A, a, a very elegant and I would say compelling story about the past, capturing the basic conflicts in Europe in a very historically, sociologically, politically informed um, analysis. And, and that really is the kind of the entree into the um, research that we're doing. So does history stop here somehow? Uh, in the sense of, does history stop here in the sense that exogenous shocks have such reverberations that they end up creating cleavages that then find expression in, in political parties that, that really are expressing the grievances around that cleavage. And, and you could, one could make an argument, yes, that history stops here or has stopped there. And, and people have done this and it's called de-alignment. Um, that is that actually at the very time that Lipton and Rockham were writing in the 1960s, that seemed as if some of these, the, the bases that underlie these cleavages became undone, became unmoored. Um, there was growing secularism. The people just didn't go to church anymore to the same degree. 
uh, it was a decline of class conflict which showed itself in the fragmentation of the working class who was working workers don't recognize themselves anymore as aligned on the, on the same side of the divide and that also uh, produced or, or was reinforced by a decline of trade union membership and there was an expansion of education and one way of reading that is that education uh, frees individuals, gives them assets, skills to, to take a distance from their social backgrounds, that they can actually sort out for themselves what is true, what is not true, what is good, what is evil, and therefore don't need to defer, have the deference to what authorities, whether that is local notable or trade union leaders or church leaders or um, chambers of commerce have to say and tell them what is the truth, what should be supported, what should be opposed. Right? So all this undermined, would, or seemed to undermine, the social moorings that guided voters to particular parties, never in a deterministic way, but in a probabilistic way, pretty much so that, you know, tell me what, whether you're working class or, or bourgeois class, and I'll tell you, or I have a good guess how you're going to vote the next election. And that the idea was that well, one, one might expect that over time, political party preferences were going to be more a matter of individual taste, of what an individual thought of, of particular issues, um, uh, the quality of candidates, um, economic cycles, government performance, and so forth, rather than individuals' personal backgrounds, where the, how they fit in in particular social groups. But there is another reading of history, and that's the next slide. <laughs> and, and it's the one we want to um, want to lay out here, and that is that perhaps history didn't stop. Perhaps there is a, a new exogenous shock that is powerful enough to shake up um, party politics and, and that's the key of, of the cleavage approach then, uh, <coughs> resort at least parts of, of, of society's social groups around um, a certain political parties. That new exogenous shock um, is called the information revolution. It's essentially a, a, a transformation in, in the economy that began sometimes in the 1960s, around the 1960s, and referring to the vital role of information or knowledge in motivating uh, economic production. And, and it's revolutionary because it's based on, on non-linear advances, breakthroughs, technological breakthroughs, essentially the invention of the computer. That is, you know, in, in, in non-kind of, uh, in, in non-physical terms, the, the, the ability to transform information knowledge into bite size, turn it into a zero to one. Those are, that, those are the bytes, essentially, which massively <laughs> reduced the economies of scale for producing information, storing information, transferring information. And that also, and that is the key that shifted the focus in economic production from producing goods, tangible things, to producing knowledge, information, much more intangible things. So it, it's a logic, it's a it's a exogenous shock that transformed. I mean, and, and you know, people didn't see it in the 1960s, right? But I'm asking you for a second to imagine a world without computers. None of you has this. In fact, this is the here, right? Because I work with some projector. You know, you don't, you can't, you can't imagine. Well, we can because we were born in a world without computers. Right? 25 years ago when I began teaching. I wasn't using PowerPoint because it hadn't been invented. I was using slides. That was that was the vanguard, you know, that was the most advanced things you could possibly have. Just these plastic slides that you put in, on a projector. Uh, you could write on them, so they had some flexibility to them. That's probably a little bit greater than PowerPoint. So but imagine you don't have any of this, and then imagine how this world would look like. That world did exist a few decades ago. So, but that has enormous <laughs> implications. I'm getting to the education. So the assets that really sorted groups on one side or the other side, um, 
around the class cleavage as a result of the industrial revolution were do you have do your own capital or do your own labor those were the assets that would sort you in a particular life on a particular life path very difficult to escape the asset that that now is decisive we argue is education Right. Um, so you've got destructuration, the idea that, you know, this, this, that a political choice, party preferences are not socially embedded, and the cleavage view, which says they are socially embedded. Well, if you look at the old class cleavage, which is the proportion of manual service workers that support each of these parties across Europe, right, each line shows you the difference in the constituency of these parties with respect to the proportion who are manual or service workers. So what you'd expect would be the social democratic parties, they're manual and service workers. The conservative parties, they're not. They're mostly the middle classes. That's the old lipstick rakan cleavage idea. And what you see here is, well, it is destructuration. I mean, just look, the Social Democrats and the radical left, compared to the Christian Democrats and the Conservatives, these little blue lines, these little green lines, mean there's less than a 10% difference. So they're almost indistinguishable. That is, the parties of the, 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 the right and the parties of the left, in the classical cleavage terms, are almost indistinguishable in terms of their class makeup. So a destructuralist will say, I told you so. I mean, the only, the only difference that is really significant, you know, this is 20 to 30% difference, is between green and tan parties. You know, they're not based on that class cleavage. And we'll have some explanation about what's going on here um, later. But the, defined, the definitive thing that you pick up from this is that when you look at the social basics of these party families, Christian Democrat conservative, social democrat radical left there's almost no difference in their social basis destructuration so professor hogan lisbeth was saying a second ago look if you in the olden days say the 1960s if you knew whether a person was working class or middle class you'd know how they voted you know that was the cleavage approach you're a worker you vote for the social democrats the socialists or the radical left if you're middle class you vote for the party on the right no longer. So it's true, a cleavage can lose its bite. But, you know, the astonishing thing, and the thing I want to turn next to, is education. Whether an individual in one of these parties has post-secondary, normally tertiary, education. And there, there is a dramatic contrast between the Green and the Tan parties. The Green parties, that is the parties that have arisen you know, on the environment, on, on alternative lifestyles, um, who were educated on the information cleavage, and town parties, traditional authoritarian nationalist parties, these nationalist right-wing populist parties. And there you see this black line joining them. And so the mean for all of the individuals who support these parties, 34% of them have post-secondary education. And what is the difference? Well, the Greens are plus 21%. They are 55%. So 55% of those who vote Green in Europe in this period, these are the Green voters. 55% of them have post-secondary education. What about the populist nationalist parties, the town parties? Well, they are minus 12. So minus 12, 22, barely more than one in five of those supporters of these, of these town parties have post-secondary education. That's what you expect in a socially rooted cleavage. So if I know, let, so let me make a guess. You are tertiary educated. I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand if you vote for a, a town party. I will not do that, but I don't think that many of you would, would, would be voting for. Of course, in the United States, you've just got two parties. So what we're talking about here 
uh, in European societies with PR proportional representation. What does that mean? Well, what it means for a cleavage theory is pretty straightforward. A cleavage theory says you've got this exogenous shock, you've got these grievances, you've got this opposition, you have the social basis, and you've got distinct parties. And you have distinct parties because in a PR system, you can get distinct parties. You can get parties that are distinctly green and distinctly tan. In a plurality electoral system like the United States, all the action is within the party. It's within the party. And so what you're talking about is how does the Republican Party relate to this? How does the Democratic Party relate to this? And generally speaking, what you find is that, you know, the tan, these tan voters would operate today within the Republican Party. And actually they're a major share of it. And these green, potentially green voters in Europe, if you're a green voter in Europe, you come to America, the chances are you'd vote for the, in, for the Democratic Party. But in Europe, it's just very clear because you have these PR, uh, PR systems. So higher educated people tend to vote green, uh, lower educated people tend to vote tan, that's the bottom line, but I think we can go further. We can actually also, and we should, look at the substance of education, that is the, the subject that people study or the field, you know, these are the study the quality. Also because, I think first because it, it tells us a lot more than what we know about the level of education, but also because it's a segue in understanding why education seems such a powerful marker um, for on, on, and, and, and the connection with the information revolution. And, and the, the core of the argument here is that educational fields represent distinctive mindsets, combine different sets of knowledge, uh, resources, skills, different ways of thinking that then also have political implications or that bias individuals with those mindsets to like or dislike different types of bodies. So that's the crux of the argument. And let me just unpack that a bit. So and let me connect that with the information revolution to the extent I can. And you might have some people come in if you, if you like there. And the information revolution is two things for education. The first one we've already said, and that is the educational expansion. And it's been really, really dramatic. You know, when we were born, which is just a few years ago, um, no, decades ago, there were the, the proportion of people who went to tertiary education, who actually went on post high school, was very small. In Europe, I've got the numbers here. The proportion of tertiary educated rose from 1.9% in 1950. If you were to hold a survey in 1950, 1.9% of your respondents would have said tertiary education. Right? The same survey, well, in 2010, 18.7% would be 18.7% would say, you know, I've completed tertiary education. Among the younger um, generations there, it would be close to 50%, 40-50% nowadays. That's massive. You know, in some of the people around the table's lifetime, this has happened. Right, so that's the first, it's the best known. But the second is that the information revolution diversified educational fields. And as a result of that, or more important than the diversification almost, it, it sort of created a rising class, a growing class of people with a particular set of, that specialized in a particular set of educational fields. Um, fields that are distant, remote, removed, and even critical of the old economy, the, the industrial capitalist economy. I'm just mentioning scientists studying science, studying math, studying philosophy, um, social and behavioral sciences, social care, personal care, teaching, you know, the connections with, you know, stepping in the industrial capitalist world are, are, are not absent, are, are not entirely absent, so they're remote, they're distant. And Underneath that is, a, is I think something that I want to bring out, that, that uh, the shift from a, an industrial society to a knowledge society um, just lays bare how different the logics, the, the way of thinking are in each of these. So in industrial society, the logic of industrial capitalism is very much focused on uh, the production of goods, and particularly private goods that you can you sell and buy 
in, in the market. They're physical things, they're cars, they're furniture, they're, they're, they're products of vegetables and meats and that type of thing. But it's emphasizing very often the, 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 good, the, the value of producing more in order to gain more benefit. Economic development is economic growth. And that's the production of more goods. And that uh, connected with that is, is market consumerism as, as a beneficial thing, as, as something that is valued. And there is the primacy of, of profit, of market, of competition. That's a, a, a logic, a predominant logic that has uh, you know, uh, been the engine of, of industrial capitalism, industrial societies. The knowledge society is different. The core is information, the production of information and the dissemination of information. And information is essentially a public good, not a private good, that is also not physical. It's more intangible, so non-physicality. And because it's a public good, there is a much, there are much greater functional reasons for why governments would be interested in investing in, in the production of information, which is essentially the investment in education and in research. And alongside, uh, alongside the private sector, but governments have which is a much greater functional reason for, for, for being present there and steering some of this. And the connection of knowledge creation with that logic of profit, market, competition is more tenuous. Um, the, the knowledge for knowledge is something that is valued as an of itself, and the immediate commercial benefit is 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 somewhat more distant. So the fields of knowledge that I mentioned: scientists, math, philosophy, social and behavioral sciences, and so forth, teaching, are, are more detached from the production of of things that are important in an industrial economy, and have created that group of people who are therefore also more in, inclined to be critical of the bad effects, the bad, the negative effects of that old economy. And that, that just made a connection to the rise of issues like environmental sustainability, um, social inclusion, gender equality, um, multiculturalism as or cosmopolitan citizenship as, as intrinsic intrinsically important things, social outcomes that cannot be and often are in conflict with the way the industrial, the old economy has been working. And so these are the issues that then underpinned grievances for a growing class of people and those people then um, ultimately, and there we go, finally arrived at the political parties, became, these became the core grievances of green parties, the first party value that, that, that emerged. Maybe you want to just pick up on the time. Yeah, uh, look, there's, there's, let me put it um, kind of directly in personal terms. You know, there's something about a person who self selects into this kind of lecture, into social science, that's, that's somehow different from a person who self selects into engineering or into business. And engineering and business are very much kind of involved in. You know the, the the order that is they're not kind of thinking outside the box in social terms what they're learning you know what in engineering i have a whole series of equations about bridge stability or something like that that would be a different that's kind of in the here and now in the current industrial capitalist system so you know it's, it's a hypothesis you know is it not just your level of education i mean every article so in a sense what we're saying and this is you know for a academic audience, they're, very, they're pretty well aware that level of education in every article explaining green or explaining town support, you'd see the level of education. What we're saying and kind of our contribution is to think through the field of education. Is there something distinct about kind of you in terms of what, what drove you, what led you to select into social science or some kind of pure science or humanities or the arts that might be connected to your propensity to vote green. Well, I can't say vote green, I've got to say think green if I'm talking in America, to think green. Is it different from a group of 
um, engineers or business students or economic students whose um, am I just being rude? Whose minds are just saying, you know, they have little dollar signs in their eyes, you know, and it's calculating, you know, financial. Let's go into the financial sector or something. So I'm, we're, we're hypothesizing, and that's the kind of the contribution of, of the intellectual contribution of what we're doing for a group of, you know, researchers who spend their lives doing this stuff. And you know, I just do. I mean, again, that personal note. You, many of you, I think, particularly if you come from a a background that at least is diverse, where you have some people who are in the so-called real economy, right? We've never been confronted with, so what are you actually learning? What is it good for? You know, and that is exactly, you know, the intangibility of, of knowledge creation, of producing and, 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 and acquiring the skills of creating knowledge that may not have immediate commercial benefits. Yeah. And so you may think, you see, green parties are about not individual goods. They're not about material goods. They're kind of skeptical of the consumer society. It's kind of a way of thinking about the public, public goods that we need to have a reproducible and sufficiently diverse environment. And that's a different kind of way of, um, of of thinking. It's not a way of thinking about the stuff of matter and fitting into a an industrial capitalist uh, society. So, and then you take the, th the theory, the argument, you're kind of advancing a step forward, and then you re you reconsider. You you look again. You look with different eyes at things we know about the green versus tan. We know that women are more likely to vote green and men are more likely to vote tan, this so-called gender gap. And we know that certain occupations are more likely to vote green, social cultural professionals, um, and, and other occupations are more likely to vote tan, production workers, service workers. Field gives you a segue in why that may be the case. Okay, so that's the kind of the theoretical setup. Now we're going to give you the the data. The pictures. The pictures. Um, around three hypotheses. Field of education is robustly associated with green and tan voting, so it really makes a difference. That's the hypothesis. Field of education explains occupation. It's not just the nature of the occupation, but somehow the field nature of the occupation. And field lies behind gender. Those are things that, you know, if you've spent your life doing this stuff should be a bit surprising for you. So to do that, we need two things. We need data on field or study. And it's amazingly difficult to get by because it's very rare that in surveys, uh, that question is asked. It's usually uh, how long have you studied or what's the level of the, the, the level at which your, your, most, your highest degree. Um, but we need more. And so we actually have um, European social survey data. It's kind of the, uh, what is it called? The Mercedes? You know, it's the the Rolls Royce. The Rolls Royce, sorry. The Rolls Royce of, so, of surveys, um, which asks these questions for three of its ways and then stops, which is very bad. But okay, at least we have that for 13 countries because we can only really do this properly for those countries where voters have both the choice to vote for green and for tan, for a tan party, right? Because we're trying to sort out under what conditions are we voting for this party versus that party, right? So that's the first thing we, we need, we have it. The second thing we need is we need information on where the field of education, these are the fields of education, education from agriculture, economics, health, personal care, social studies, plus teacher all the way, right? And and how, what kind of knowledge skills are central in these field of education? And they, here we lean on data that was um, generated, um, collected by Dutch sociologists some time ago around the time of this survey, not using this one, an external survey, which is better, which is great. And we use that, we package that information by creating a zero to one scale 
from low to high cultural community skills. That is the cultural community skills, the skills that have to do with creative writing, deliberation, how to negotiate, uh, history, uh, critical analysis, abstract thinking, these types of things, you know, the type of stuff that we like you to focus on, right? Um, you know, those high on, on those types of skills versus um, then a set of skills that, 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 that they are calling economic or technical that have much more to do with hands-on, hands-on learning, applied skills that, that prepare you for the commercial world out there. And so we use that information to create, to generate, to put these fields um, on a zero to one scale. And then we use, and we can impute that information in two ways, in the individual level information on people, respondents that we have here. One is what we call an individual sect. We call it sect because it's culture, economics, communicative, technical skills, an individual sect score fund that depends on which field people said they actually completed their, their highest degree in. So someone who has says, I'm a teacher, I completed teacher training, gets a one, that's the math. Someone said, I completed agriculture, gets a zero. It doesn't matter whether this person never finished high school but says, you know, my lowest, my highest degree is agriculture, or whether this person is actually someone who studied a PhD in agriculture, they both get a zero. That's a zero, and the same here. So level of education has nothing to do with this. This is purely the substance of education. So that's one, individual level. The other thing we can do is we know in which occupation these people work. We have very detailed data on occupation. And we can calculate the average, call it knowledge environment, of an occupation. What does the average, what kind of what, what has the average person in an occupation studied in terms of on, on this scale? What's the average score? And we can tie that to the particular individual. So the first one gives us a sense of the individual's knowledge asset, what they studied. And the second one gives us a sense of in what kind of work environment do they find themselves? And what's the knowledge environment uh, character of, of that work environment? Okay. So this is going straight to the kind of the model where we explore the effect of those variables under a variety of, of controls. Um, and then we explain voting green, that's a dependent variable. So what matters, what are the variables that have power, statistical power, in, it, in predicting whether an individual is going to be voting green or voting tan? And what you see here is that for voting green, individual sect and occupational sect are extremely powerful. I mean, for some, for, for the academic world, that's a pretty surprising finding because that level of education, which is the variable, that's significant too. You can see it's significant because the variation around that particular <coughs> score is uh, relatively small and it departs from, it's statistically uh, different from, from zero. But individual sector and occupational sector are even stronger. So it matters whether someone had tertiary or post-secondary education. It also is a prediction if you've studied in one of those high sect fields that uh, Lisbeth was just talking about, well, that has a pretty, even a greater statistical influence on whether an individual votes green. And then these are the controls that we, uh, that we impose, whether a person's female or male, rural or urban, that's a that's a um, four um, categories. The age of a person is, you know, younger people will tend to vote green, but it's not statistically significant. And whether you're secular or religious. So, you know, wow, that's, these, that's pretty strong results. For tan, well, occupational, whether you're in an occupation, that's a tan occupation. Let me give you a tan occupation, train driver, a transport worker, those are tan. Minor. Minor. Oil worker. Um, hard rock miner. Those kinds of things. Those are particularly tan occupations. But also engineer. Engineer, yes. Economist. Economist. That is highly significant and, and very powerful, even more so than the level of education. You know, the, the line on the level of education is those without 
post-secondary education have a greater propensity to vote town than those who have it. But actually, the field is more important, and individual sect is also a significant here. So those are pretty, you know, pretty powerful results. So they make you think again about education. And so if education really is the key to this new cleavage, what we're saying is, hey, don't just look at the level of education, look at its substance as well. There's something about people who go into those fields. Maybe it's not the field itself. We're not saying, oh, it's what we professors are teaching you or those that, that but you're self-selected. You've decided to, to be here. You, you're here because you wanted to be here. So there's something about that self-selection process that could be really critical. But whatever it is, this is about the pattern of associations. Those people with those characteristics have a propensity to vote green or to vote um, towns. And here we break it up. Here we look at, well, <laughs> what about the people who have post-secondary education? Does feel better for those kinds of people? Here are the people who don't have post-secondary education, and they only have secondary education, does the field matter for them too? So in the United States, you don't really have much of a field focus in, in, in high school. But in many Europeans, you do have something like that. So we can actually look at the field of people who have completed only secondary education. And what you see for green, for green voting, well, this is the percentage probability voting green. So people here with a very low sect, about 7%, just over 7% would vote green among highly educated people, post-secondary educated people. When they have a high sect, so these are the people with the you know, engineering degrees, here are the people with the social science and teaching degrees, well, it jumps up to more than 13%. So we're actually roughly you know, doubling the likelihoods that a person with post-secondary education would vote green depending on their sect, the field in which they did their studies. And these are the people who have only secondary education. It still makes a difference, it's still significant. So if you don't have post-secondary education, you're at about you know, 4%, 4.5% voting green. If you're in a high sect field, well, you're jumping up to almost a 9%. So it works both. It's not just whether you have post-secondary or not post-secondary education. The sect matters on both those groups. And the same is pretty much true. It's not as strong for town. The strongest effects of a green who tend to have this post-secondary education. In the town, well, look, the as you move up through sect into the social science and teaching fields, your probability of voting tan diminishes. Here at low sect, well, we're talking this is a non people who don't have secondary education. Obviously, it's higher for tan. That's the gap, that's the level of education gap. But the sect gap is the slope of that, um, of, of that relationship. And here it's above 10%, and here it's you know around 10%. And for those who have post secondary education, you're talking about you know five percent declining with high sect to to um, around three um, percent. So it, it matters. Field matters whether or not you have post secondary education for both green voting, especially, but also for tan voting. So what does field of education say about um, the fact that particular occupations tend to vote green and other occupations tend to vote? Um, and actually, it says quite a lot. I want to see, see this. What we've done here is using that occupational sector, as Isabella said. So, we're actually situating an individual in the work environment, in the character of the, the knowledge environment. And someone, mind you, most of our life, waking life, we are at work. So, that's a key influence. So, that's, that's why a lot of people look at that. So this is this is an indication of, of where that individual the, where that individual is placed, the kind of occupation that the person is in, and the occupation is rated according to the, the extent of 
communicative and cultural um, skills that are pre prevalent there among the people who work in it. Right? So that's the occupational sector. That is related to the likelihood that people in that occupation are going to vote either green or tan on this side. And what you can see is that there's a very strong connection between the knowledge environment, these are high sex occupations, and the likelihood that these people are going to vote green. This horizontal line is the average in the sample. So on average, all respondents together, 7.7% of our respondents in the early 2000s in Europe in the 13 countries voted green, and, and it's 7.6% voted time. If we could do this with recent data, both of these averages would be higher. Don't categorically have to be seen. But this is really, these are the occupations that are, pre that are overwhelmingly green, or they're more than twice as, as green as, as the average. And these are the occupations that are more than twice likely to vote time as the average occupation. And there's virtually no overlap. There's only one, these are numbered because this is part of a list of detailed list of occupations. There's 155 of them. So you can look at what they are. I'll give you some examples in a bit. Um, there's only one of these 155 that is uh, over, that overlaps. That is where both green voters and tan voters are all overrepresented. It's a tiny occupation and it's internally heterogeneous, but essentially these are different worlds. And so here to give you a sense of who these are, these are teachers, various types of teachers from primary teachers to university teachers, social workers, artists, writers, handicraft workers, handicraft workers, artists and handicraft workers, sports professionals, librarians, social scientists, life science scientists, uh, nearly all high sex, as you can see, all the upper boundaries of the high sex. Tan occupations here are often semi-skilled, working with heavy machine tools, as you mentioned, miners, construction workers, machine operators, vehicle drivers, taxi drivers would be there, engineers, crop or animal producers. They're here, low sex. So you can look at, you can say production workers tend to vote tan, but actually you get a better idea of why that is by looking at the kind of knowledge environment these people typically <coughs> work in. And the same with social cultural professionals, I just mentioned them, they tend to vote green. But again, you can actually understand this, I think a little bit more substantively by connecting it to the knowledge environment that these people are working in. Okay, so you know, you really think, well, there's a real social structure here, you know, that things, the way in which people express their lives really, really matters. And I want to get into the gender gap. I mean, it's very well known. We all know. I mean, just look at the last election midterms. You know, you've got you've got age, but you know, gender really matters. Um, I can't actually. What was the number that we kind of came up with? Well, particularly among, among the young people, it turns out. You know, just Huge. those. It was almost a twenty percent gap. Yeah, women tend to vote for the Democratic Party. Men tend to vote, you know, less educated men tend to vote for the Republican Party. When you start to pull all those things together, age, gender, a level, level of education, no one's done it with fields. But if you did it with field two, you'd explain a lot of the difference between Republicans and Democrats. Well, what is this gender gap? And I've got, a, I think, quite an amazing way to, to, to show you this. And that's these violin distributions. And this is males and, and females. And you know these are the so this is where this is the distribution. A lot of men are at close to zero, doing those engineering kinds of kinds of stuff. You know there are some scientists and social scientists here as well, um, but women tend to be much more north. That is high sex occupations, high sex fields, I should say. And the average for men is just above three. The average for females is above five. So more than you know, 0.5 on this, on our zero to one sect, a sex scale. So what this indicates is, you know, what's going on with gender? What's going on with gender? We know that women now tend to have a greater um, presence in tertiary education than, than males. And that's true in 25 of 27 um, OECD countries. And um, you can see that 
males tend to pick more kind of low sect fields and women tend to pick more high sect uh, fields. So it kind of gives you an insight into you know, how is gender mediated into, into voting. Is that me? Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, so what we've done here is we've just blotted out the occupations that where there's no overrepresentation of either tan or green. So these are the overrepresented green ones, these are the overrepresented tan ones, again on the occupational sex scale. And here is then the proportion of women in those occupations. Right. So these are the same miners and construction workers, etc., that we talked about before, but also engineers. And, and these are, and, and the picture says it clearly, this sorting going on like crazy. That is, men and women don't work in the same type of job, right? Here, the average proportion of women, and, and the least overrepresented, the, the, the yellow tan occupations, is 9%. The average percentage of women, average, of course, this variation, is 69%. Isn't that amazing? I mean, this is just, you know, normally with this kind of data, everything's fuzzy. I mean, just look how crystal clear um, this is. I mean, I've worked as an undergraduate right down here. I was um, loading big vats of glue. This was enormously heavy. Um, and they were just it was all male. And I, so I know what, you know, what happens in these all male. You know, when you, some of these occupations, the 95% or 99% male occupations, you know, they tend to be semi-skilled or unskilled occupations. Um, they tend to be low sect and they have a particular, I don't know if you ever work with oil workers or the kind of culture that you find that I'm not going to go into the details, but you might be able to um, imagine. And then I'm looking around, you know, so you, you are a pretty mixed audience in terms of gender. So I, I, I can't really, I was trying to count, but I'm not going to get there. Um, but you know, you're at least kind of 50, 50 and we are in, in social science, you know, where do you find the male predominant? fields you know these are the engineering style um style fields which are for us low sect i just want to say this is not a deterministic argument right you're not bound because you're a woman to go and work in these fields right this is you know and there's a bias there is a likelihood a much greater likelihood when you are a woman that will find you in one of those fields or something related right and it's far less likely you're going to find you in, in one of those. That's what I'm saying. But it's not impossible. It's true. Look, there's this whole um, kind of analysis of STEM, right? These are these, you know, the the, the, the economic and 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 science, high science, science technology, technology, economic, right? and math. Right. And they're very there are far fewer women there. What distinguishes these people? It's the people who have greater males tend to have greater confidence in their own abilities. So they've done these multiple choice tests. The women do just as well as the men, but the men think they're going to do a lot better. Um, and so it's that kind of, you know, I, there's a word for it, chutzpah, really, that kind of, you know, gets people into, so there's nothing, um, you know, there's nothing deterministic about this. And of course, we're talking about green and tan parties. We're talking about subsections of the population. I mean, cleavage is not that everybody goes in one direction or the other. Is that you get particular groups with particular grievances forming particular parties. It's not about making the whole terrain green um, or, or tan when you have a PR system. So we're going to go straight to the conclusion and we want to have a discussion and listen to whatever you have to say, your comments. Um, the first, you know, being, being really intellectual, cleavage theory rocks. <laughs> that is to say, look, it's a pretty ambitious theory. It's not our theory. We are, Marty Lipset was, Simon Marty Lipset was, was my PhD advisor. Um, and so, you know, we're building on the work by Lipset and, uh, and, 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 Rukai. and yeah, sure. The, a lot is destructured. A lot is just, you know, free floating choice, but there's something kind of rooted about these green parties and, and these town parties. And it's rooted in such a way that cleavage theory can speak to it with really quite a bit of um, quite a bit of insight in which you're connecting. I mean, think about what you're connecting. I mean, what Lipson and Rakan were doing, they were connecting a change that happened 500 years ago. 
half a millennium ago to parties that were existing around them in their world. I mean, that, you know, you've got distal causal theory. Distal means great distance. That's distal theory. If someone can turn around to me and say, something that happened 500 years ago, I'll show you the evidence today. I'm you know, going to be pretty impressed. And so what we're doing is we're extending this. It's not the end of rooted conflict. It's not the end of rooted conflict. And then what we're doing is we're saying, sure, education, that's what people put on the table. But it's not just the extent. You've got to get inside education too. What leads people into particular fields? What drives them? And, and what we're saying too is, well, you know, these are puzzles. You know, what? So you're sitting here in a class in, in social science. What, you know, what, when did you, I, that we could do a, a survey. When, did, you know, when do you think that you were drawn into social science? You know, what was good? What were your parents like? What, what were the influence? What was your social network like as a young person? What were the classes that you took like? What was the kind of, so these things are based in, in, in childhood or early adulthood. We're not saying, ah, go bring a person, a town person, put them in our class and we'll turn them green. I mean, I'd like to think that, but it's not true. <laughs> what we're saying is there's something going on. And you know, often interesting results give you more of a puzzle than a certainty. You know, we've talked about certain things that have very strong connections, incredible associations that really honestly have not been kind of discovered. You know, people have just kind of washed over them. But we really, you know, if you press us, we, there are many things that we, we, we can't explain. And we can't explain, you know, we know that field really matters, but exactly why it matters, when it matters, we need different kinds of, of information. So we can do survey here, but I guess a more rigorous way in that one could go about this, and we're trying to do this in the next step, is to use panel data. I think most of you are familiar with the concept. It is where you have the same individuals, you visit the same individuals repeatedly, like every year, and so you can observe or note how they change over, over time. So most um, countries, or many countries have these panel surveys. It depends on whether you have a question that you have. For example, to, to get a handle, beginning to get a handle on, on the, the, the topic that you raised a few times, that is, is it, is it, is it because one studies a certain field that one become, becomes green leaning or tan leaning? Is that that's in school socialization? Or is it because you've chosen that field and that studying it then helps hone your skills and, and strengthen perhaps your biases, but it's the self-selection in it, which probably means that you picked up values um, somewhere else prior, from your parents, from your peer groups, from the social backgrounds that, that you were brought into, the neighborhoods that you lived in, for example, your childhood experiences. So in order to get a handle on that, you want to just kind of get people early on, ideally, when they're still kids, and then follow them and way into adulthood. Is the effect of fields education durable? I mean, after 30 years, you just completed education 30 years ago, is it still, does it still that have that effect? Again, you know, ideally you want to just follow individuals as they move through life and see whether the effect weakens, disappears, gets replaced by others. And then finally, and related to that, what if you kind of have inconsistent cues, if you like? For example, a humanities person marries an engineer. Which happens less and less in a sense, doesn't it? It does, it does. And apparently uh, digital apps, you know, the, the the social media uh, pairing, uh, there is an exception. <laughs> 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 um, you know, has, has enhanced that as well. People select and select more people with similar um, knowledge backgrounds, I would say, let's say with the same education. Or say an engineer happens to be appointed here, you know, in the social studies department for some reason, and just, just pick up a job here. Does that people change? Again, panel data would be brilliant. Um, you're asking a lot here, but we'll do, we'll try, and maybe you will try as well. That's it. And yeah. so, 